marking the 90th birthday of the BBC World Service and the brief return of some old friends. This is London. This is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. The BBC World Service is 90 years old this month. This is London Calling. It began as a crackly shortwave station, broadcasting only in English. The world war against fascism transformed it. Broadcasting in more than 45 languages. At the BBC, we went through one of the most important adventures of our lives. It has grown into a global network. At the age of 18, all of a sudden, I was one of those refugees that overnight I became a journalist, started working for the BBC. Remarkable people, an amazing sound archive, famous names. Mr McCartney? Yeah. Good evening. Good uh, evening. Can I call you just uh, simply Paul? Yeah, please. OK. Join me, Nick Rankin, for a special 90th anniversary tribute. You're listening to the BBC World Service, broadcasting not just in English, but in 42 other languages. That's Persian you're hearing now, from Broadcasting House in the centre of London. So we broadcast on TV, we have radio programs, we have podcasts, we have Instagram and Twitter and Telegram. That's the anchor, Najee Gulami, covering a story of world interest, the uprising against the government in Iran. They tried to block us for so many years. In the past, they tried to jam us, but that hasn't been successful. People always find ways to watch us and to listen and to get in touch. The BBC World Service is like that. Its staff come from all over the globe, and its journalism is committed to the whole world. Its roots are its distant listeners. My name's Nick Rankin, and in this special anniversary programme, I want to tell you the story of this international broadcasting service and about some of its people. Let's start with how it began, very slowly, 90 years ago, with only four staff and a budget of £10, that's $12, a week for programmes. This is London Calling. London Calling the Australasian Zone. A century ago, Britain was the world's only superpower, ruling one in five people on Earth, in 60-some countries dispersed all around the world. Before beginning our first program... It seems quite extraordinary now. Back then, radio was the newest way to communicate, to project power and everything you believed in. The Soviet Union had done it, and so had the Vatican, using radio to propagate their faiths, communism and Catholicism, abroad. Now, the British Broadcasting Corporation entered the fray. On the 19th of December, 1932, working from Studio 3B inside Broadcasting House, its brand new white stone headquarters in the West End of London, via new transmitters and aerials, a global wireless service cautiously got underway. It was introduced by the BBC's grandiloquent Director-General, Sir John Reith. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Broadcasting is a development with which the future must reckon and reckon seriously. Here is an instrument of almost incalculable importance. Every day, a series of programmes will be sent out to all parts of the Empire somewhere between five in the afternoon and midnight, 
local time. Don't expect too much in the early days. The programmes will neither be very interesting nor very good. A great deal of experiment has yet to be done. Six days later, King George V, Emperor of India, made the first royal Christmas broadcast beamed worldwide. Tens of thousands of people around the world heard his voice for the first time. Through one of the marvels of modern science, I speak now from my home and from my heart to you all. To men and women so cut off by the snow, the desert, or the sea, that only voices out of the air can reach them. London calling the British Empire. London calling the continent of Africa. London calling southern Rhodesia. The Gambia and the Gold Coast. Nigeria and Sierra Leone. Kenya, Somaliland, Uganda, Tanganyika. Zanzibar and Niazaland. Mauritius. All the listeners were all from huge, great, big shortwave sites scattered across the globe. I mean, they're enormous. Have you seen pictures of these things? They're the size of a small town. They've got 15 different masts that are all 200 feet high with wires strung in between them. John Goder is a hands-on engineer with more than 25 years' experience of the technical side of world service broadcasting. He knows it in the studio and out in the field. But the difficulty with it is it's incredibly expensive for start, and you've got to get it there, and you've got to get it there over very long, directly connected copper bits of cable, essentially. So that sort of technology, so very long undersea cables, leaving the UK, heading overseas, and then spanning countries and deserts to get to these shortwave sites, which are in places like the, you know, the Horn of Africa, Ascension outside Island. Hong Kong, the Ascension Islands. They, I mean, really difficult places to get to. But Ascension's a good example. I mean, they had their own town, effectively. They had their own water supply, their own electricity generation, and then coming down a bit of copper under the sea to them was the World Service that they then broadcast. The British Empire seemed everlasting, but aggressive new powers were rising in the 1930s. Imperial Japan attacking Manchuria, Italy invading Abyssinia, and Nazi Germany swelling in Europe. From April 1933, when Adolf Hitler came to power, radio became an instrument of the brutal Nazi state, compulsory at home, bellowing abroad. The German shortwave radio station at Zesen, with eight 50 kilowatt transmitters, broadcast German news, music and propaganda round the world 24 hours a day in a dozen tongues. And when fascist Italy joined Nazi Germany with anti-British radio broadcast in Arabic from its station at Bari, the British government responded. Huna London. Sayyidati wa Sadati. Nahnu nudhi'u al-yawma min London bil-lughati al-arabiyyati li-awwali marratin fi tarikh The Foreign Office asked the BBC to start broadcasting straight news in Arabic. The BBC hired the announcer A.K. Surur and the poet Aziz Rifat from the Egyptian State Broadcasting Service. And on the 3rd of January 1938, the Amir Saif al-Islam Hussein, the son of the King of Yemen, inaugurated the BBC's Arabic service. It was not just news. There was music, a poetry competition, daily readings from the Quran. That's the end of the official opening of the Arabic transmission from London on a wavelength of 31.3 meters and a frequency of 9.58 megacycles per second. Our regular daily transmissions will start tomorrow at 5.17 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. In September 1938, when Adolf Hitler angrily demanded the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia, where many German speakers lived, 
the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain tried to appease him, anxious to avoid a devastating European war. Mr Chamberlain spoke on the BBC Empire service, presenting himself as a man of peace. But today there is a lull for a brief time and I want to say a few words to you men and women of Britain and the Empire and perhaps to others as well. How horrible, fantastic, incredible it is that we should be digging trenches and trying on gas masks here because of a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. Here speaks London. Sie haben soeben eine Rede, Mr. Neville Chamberlain. Imagine the flurry and consternation in the BBC when the Foreign Office asked them to translate Chamberlain's speech into French, German and Italian and broadcast it at a couple of hours' notice. Thus, the BBC European service was born in a rush of improvisation on the 27th of September, 1938. The bone of the Sudetenland did not appease Hitler's hunger for territory. In March 1939, Nazi Germany occupied all Czechoslovakia and six months later invaded Poland. World War transformed the BBC. Announcers no longer wore dinner jackets and black tie at the microphone. Well, I'm standing on the roof of Broadcasting House on this evening of uh, Sunday in September. You can see their flashes quite plainly against the background of the dark houses and the trees. The sun has just set, and this sky now is illuminated only by the moon. It's a perfectly clear night. I can actually see St. Paul's and the city churches silhouetted against the blaze. The searchlights are now starting to stab the sky. One, two, three, four, five large fires blazing away on the horizon. It was a time of tin hats, sandbags, gas masks. Many more women became producers, presenters, engineers. There were new faces and new voices. Cieszę się, że z okazji otwarcia polskich audycji w brytyjskim radio w Londynie mogę przemówić do was, drodzy rodacy. That's Count Edward Ratzinski, the Polish ambassador and later president of the Republic of Poland in exile, introducing the BBC Polish service, which began four days after the declaration of war. Through 1940, the European language services grew. Broadcast in Albanian, Bulgarian, Cypriot, Czech, Danish, Dutch, Finnish, Flemish for Belgium, French for Belgium, Icelandic, Magyar, Maltese, Norwegian, Romanian, Serbo-Croat, Slovak, Slovene, Swedish. When Greece fell under German control, the Greek broadcasters brought their radio call sign with them into exile on a gramophone record. The shepherd's horn and sheep bells sounding not from the mountains of Greece, but from Bush House in rainy London during the Blitz. Bush House became the new home in London for the overseas service from 1941. It was a grand stone building near the River Thames, but the dormitories and offices inside were cramped. Personnel numbers had increased 14 times over. One fluent linguist the BBC recruited was 22-year-old Martin Eslin. Born in Budapest, a drama student of Max Reinhardt's in Vienna, he fled the Nazis first to Brussels and then to Britain where, like so many other German-speaking refugee Jews and intellectuals, he was interned on the Isle of Man. Freed in 1940, Martin Eslin joined the BBC German service as a scriptwriter and producer. Martin would go on to become the head of BBC radio drama. In the crowded rooms and corridors in the basement, space was restricted and life extremely chaotic. The war with its bombs and anxieties was an unhappy enough time in all our lives. But it was a very exhilarating experience nevertheless. For here, assembled by the chances and vicissitudes of war, was a real microcosm of European intellectual life. 
Some had happened to be in London at the time, and others had arrived during the retreat of their forces from the continent. Others again turned up by mysterious ways and means. Their private lives were completely disorganized, but anyhow, most of them hardly had any private lives. At first, from a very small number of improvised studios, the voice of Britain and the voice of the occupied countries was going out strongly and steadily. I well remember the tall figure of General de Gaulle going down in the lift to make one of his memorable broadcasts. Ce soir, veille du 14 juillet, il n'est pas une pensée française qui ne soit pour la France seule. The Second World War ranged far beyond its European starting point into Africa and Asia. BBC London. The Hindustani service, speaking Hindi Urdu to Indian soldiers and sailors, had Zulfika Ali Bakari, later the Director General of Radio Pakistan, as the first Indian section observer as the BBC then called its correspondents or reporters. London se MEF or Pai Force ke Fauji Bahadron ke khidmat mein aadab. Bakari introduced Venu Chitali to the Eastern Service in 1940, where amongst other work, she broadcast in English and Marathi. Venu Chitali. Namaste Maharashtra. Achya Radio Zankarat, Nehmi Pramane, Pratham Yuddha Samalochan, Nantar Shriyut S.A. Dange, यांचा ब्रिटिश कामगाराच्या आयुष्यातील काही दृश्ये या मथळ्या खालील लेख आय हॅव वन ऑफ वेनो चिटली स्क्रिप्ट्स इन इंग्लिश फॉर द प्रोग्राम थ्रू ईस्टर्न आईज व्हिच वेंट आउट ऑन न्यू इयर्स डे 1942 आई रीड यू अ बिट द स्काइज अबव लंडन व्हिच आर नाउ डॉटेड विथ बैराज बलून्स डे एंड नाईट वर बिफोर द वॉर द हाईवे ऑफ ओनली बर्ड्स एंड सिव्हिल एयरक्राफ्ट Many meadows still look as innocent as they did before the war, but conceal secret weapons of defense. Camouflaged buildings all over the country are commonplace. Burmese, Thai, Malay, Cantonese and Mandarin Chinese, 40 languages, over 230 hours a week to the four quarters of the world. Ninja London is the Bunga Radio of Englishman. Shunavandagana Girami, Ignak, Sohan. From December 1940, four bulletins a week in Farsi for the Persian service. In wartime, radio was a lifeline. When listening was a crime under Nazi occupation, people hid themselves away in secret with their radios. Here's Jeanette Spanier. I remember when we were in hiding in Nice during the war, I would listen with my ear right, right up to the set so that only a faint whisper came through. Suddenly, Churchill's voice started. Great, rolling, beautiful English coming towards us, which was very moving in itself. But in the middle, I think he was speaking to the Canadians, he changed into French, into terribly bad, wonderful French. Français, c'est moi, Churchill, qui vous parle. Pendant plus de 30 ans... The fact of his speaking to us in our language, we, who were like forgotten people, was such an emotion that I shall probably never experience one so violent again. The wireless sparked hope and a meme of resistance. The Belgians began the V campaign. Victor de Lavalle, an exiled politician now running the BBC Belgian service, thought of using the letter V as a defiant symbol for both languages of his country. V stood for victoire, victory in French, and Vreiheit, freedom in Flemish. Why not chalk the letter V on the walls of the Low Countries to annoy the Germans, he broadcast in January 1941. The French picked up the idea as did the Dutch and the Danes and the Czechs. Then the visual idea went sonic. The letter V in Morse is dot, 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 dash. The percussionist James Blades made the European service V signal on an African drum in Bush House. Douglas Ritchie, the assistant news editor, 
became Colonel Britain behind the microphone, urging on a secret army. You wear no uniforms, and your weapons are different from ours. But they're not less deadly. The fact that you wear no uniforms is your strength. The Nazi official and the German soldier don't know you. But they fear you. The night is your friend. The V is your sign. The V went viral. When the Latin Americans joined in, Vs appeared in La Paz, Bolivia. And it became a lasting gesture. Winston Churchill himself adopted the V sign with his fingers and made V for victory famous. BBC News was precious in occupied Europe, even a matter of life or death. People used to copy down the broadcast and then distribute them in secret newsletters. The voice from the studios was as distant as a voice from another world. Jan Novak Jezioranski was a leading member of the Polish Home Army. You know, a month or two back, in July, I was present at an underground meeting when suddenly there was a terrific banging at the door. We had no doubts as to who it was. Such banging could have come only from the Gestapo. The meeting was early afternoon, and therefore all those participating still had the radio news in their pockets. Automatically, they all began to tear up the papers and swallow it. How furious we were when, after having swallowed all the compromising material, the doors opened and one of our own men came in. Known as the courier from Warsaw for his dangerous trips to keep in touch with the Polish government in exile, he was one of the first to report the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in 1943. Here's one version broadcast by the BBC World Service. The Germans tried to storm the ghetto with tanks, planes and artillery. For three weeks they attacked again and again, but they failed. Still, the Polish and Jewish colors fluttered from the wrecked ghetto houses. Then, the Germans adopted another method. They began to burn the houses using their flamethrowers. The Jews fought covered in cellars and sewers while the Germans systematically liquidated house after house. The whole of Warsaw was filled with smoke, soot and burnt remains of timber and paper which were swept along the streets by the wind. The ghetto which occupied one-sixth of the whole area of Warsaw was reduced to a stony desert. To understand this drama, one has to live through it. It's impossible to describe in words. By the end of the Second World War, the world was entirely changed. There were 50 million dead, and millions of living DPs, displaced people or refugees, and that's just in Europe. After D-Day, when Allied forces began freeing Europe from Nazi rule, BBC roving microphones could get right into the happy crowds at the liberation of Paris in August 1944. Merci pour tout les Bush House faced new challenges in the second half of the 20th century. Exiles went home to repair their lives. Others made their home in London forever. The British Empire was dissolving, decolonizing, and the politics of the Cold War already starting to freeze. The World Service had to mirror those changes. It found new audiences and took on new staff. You could just walk into Bush House and immediately be swallowed up by the atmosphere. That's Peter Palai of the Hungarian Service. You were immediately engulfed in the world and it was very, very lively, 40 odd languages. Yes, 40 odd nationalities. It was an absolute treasure trove of knowledge. Unbelievable people. Challenging times, changing fortunes. Stay with us on the BBC World Service after the news. This is the BBC World Service, where we join Mikiko Sagawa on a very personal journey in Japan. When I was a young woman in my 20s, I was admitted to a mental health hospital. 
I was put in a solitary confinement. It was terrifying. I now live and work in Tokyo, but I never stopped wanting to know about people who've been through the system like me. There were people who had been in the hospital longer than I had. As far as I know, there were five or six patients who'd been there for 30 years. Mental health is a taboo for many in Japan. I wanted to get a sense of the history and maybe begin to get an understanding of why Japanese people still see mental health as a stigma. Asylums of Japan at bbcworldservice.com slash documentaries. The BBC World Service is 90 years old this month. It began as a crackly shortwave station broadcasting only in English. It has grown into a global network, staffed often by journalists exiled from their own lands, telling the truth in its news, trusted in times of trouble. Join me, Nick Rankin, for a special 90th anniversary tribute. Here on the BBC World Service, just after the news. BBC News. Nigerian security forces have rescued seven Chinese miners who were kidnapped by gunmen in June. Special forces carried out the operation overnight in the northern state of Kaduna. Police in Germany say they've recovered a significant part of the treasure stolen from Dresden Castle three years ago. 31 objects have been returned to the Green Vault Museum. The former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan says his party will dissolve two provincial assemblies later this month. Mr Khan's party governs the provinces of Punjab and Hebar Pakhtunkhwa. The move is seen as an attempt to put pressure on the federal government to hold early general elections. Supporters of India's governing BJP have set fire to effigies of Pakistan's Foreign Minister Balawal Bhutto Zardari. This week at the UN in New York, he called Prime Minister Narendra Modi the butcher of Gujarat. The well-known Iranian film actress Tarane Ali Dusti has been arrested as anti-government protests continue. A semi-official news agency said that Ms Ali Dusti was detained for publishing what it called false and distorted content and inciting chaos. She publicly condemned the execution of a protester earlier this month. Russia has condemned as political censorship a decision by Moldova to suspend the licenses for six Russian TV channels. Moldova accuses Russia of airing false information about the country and the war in Ukraine. Croatia have secured third place at the World Cup in Qatar, beating Morocco 2-1 in a tightly fought match. And Australian football authorities are investigating crowd violence at a league match in Melbourne that left a goalkeeper with suspected concussion. The derby between Melbourne City and Melbourne Victory, Victory was called off after fans invaded the pitch. BBC News. You're listening to BBC World Service. And in this special anniversary feature, we're telling the story of this radio network, which is now 90 years old. By 1945, it was talking to a changed world. Two new global superpowers, the USA and the USSR, were beginning their Cold War. The aging British Empire was breaking up. The Kingdom of Jordan was the first to gain independence, followed by India and Pakistan in 1947. I have a message from His Majesty the King to deliver to you today. This is His Majesty's message. The last Viceroy of India was Lord Mountbatten. I send you all my greetings and heartfelt wishes. Freedom-loving people everywhere will wish to share in your celebration. On the 4th of January 1948, it was the turn of Burma, Myanmar today. This morning's auspicious event, the signing of a treaty of friendship between His Majesty's government in the United Kingdom and the provisional government of Burma, marks the opening of a new chapter, not only in the history of Burma, but in the history of the world. 
Burma will soon cease to be a part of the British Empire, to which her people have hitherto owed an unwilling allegiance. The choice of languages on the BBC reflected the changing world. When mandatory Palestine became the State of Israel in May 1948, the World Service started broadcasting in Hebrew. This is London calling in the Hebrew service of the BBC. A world of new nations meant hearing new voices. Probably the most influential literary strand ever broadcast on the World Service was a programme for writers from the West Indies. Caribbean Voices was started by Una Marson, the BBC's first black radio producer. Over its 15 years, it showcased work by hundreds of contributors, including two future winners of the Nobel Prize for Literature, V.S. Naipaul and Derek Walcott. One of the presenters of the programme was the Jamaican poet and educator John Figueroa, a key figure in the development of Caribbean studies. You will notice in this poem by Derek Walcott, which I'm going to read for you, not only a variety of tone, but also a great variety of kinds of English used. Popa, that was a fet. I mean, it had free rum, free whiskey, and some fellas beating pan from one of them ban in Trinidad. And everywhere you turn was people eating and drinking. And don't name me, but I think they catch his wife with two tests up the beach while he drunk, quoting Shelley with each generation has its angst, but we has none. Walcott can be called a poet in the same sense that Naipaul and Lamming are novelists because he has managed to draw on and unite and embody not only the various strands of our emotional and intellectual heritage, but also of our different voices. London, BBC, My name is Peter Parlay. I started 1966. I worked for the Hungarian section, became senior producer, ended up running the Budapest Bureau. So how long were you working at World Service? Embarrassingly, 31 years, <laughs> altogether. As a Jewish child in wartime Hungary, Peter hid from the Nazis. As a teenager in 1956, he stood up against the Russian invasion. Then he had to escape his homeland and found a home in Bush House. A huge jazz fan, a kayaker, Peter was a teacher who happened to fall into broadcasting. What he experienced over his years at Bush House was a kind of decolonization from the old BBC Empire Service model. When I walked in there, it was a very gentlemanly old place. No, you got into a lift with people from all over the world. I worked on the eighth floor usually. First, the language services were really just translation agencies, and, you know, translating news, press review, what have you. And from the 60s onwards, and mainly from the 70s onwards, you could do more and more individual work. You could do documentaries of your own. So it evolved and it was far more exciting as time went on. So th that was an enormous sea change in the whole of broadcasting. Because Bush House had a lot of people who were far more intelligent and far more capable of doing something more coherent, deeper, and it wasn't being used. It was an absolute treasure trove of knowledge. Unbelievable people. Tego na pravika. Naj posle tego na pravika. O'Brien sedesha na masa pod lampa sa zelena bažur i kup knjiža pred nego. That's the voice of Georgi Markov, reading from the Bulgarian translation of 1984, George Orwell's novel about a man struggling for freedom and truth inside Big Brother's totalitarian state. Georgi Markov had been a hugely popular writer in communist Bulgaria, an insider a privileged member of the intelligentsia. But, exiled in London, he became a stinging critic of the regime. One evening in September 1978, 
Georgi Markov was on Waterloo Bridge near Bush House when an unknown man bumped into him. Markov's wife, Annabel. All I know is that my husband was a very healthy man. He was a very strong man. The doctors told me that, that he had a constitution of an ox. That's how they put it. He came home on Thursday night and told me the most extraordinary story that he'd been jabbed with an umbrella tip. He showed me the mark that the umbrella had made. What was it like? It was like the point of a hypodermic. She was speaking to Peter Snow of ITN. During those four days when he was in hospital, what kind of thing was he talking about when he was able to talk to you? He was able to talk to me all the time. I mean, there's been a lot of inaccurate reports saying that he was, he was unconscious all the time. He wasn't. He was, he was conscious right up to the end, and I was with him until he died. It was an absolute shock for all of us. I mean, I like Georgi, he was a lovely guy. But I mean, it's a terrible shock. It's a colleague murdered in broad daylight on the bridge, you know. Horrible, absolutely horrible. Yeah, it, it was a tremendous shock. No one has ever been charged with the murder of the BBC broadcaster Georgi Markov over 40 years ago. There's no doubt that the Bulgarian Secret Service murdered him with help from the Russian KGB who supplied the tiny pellet filled with poison, ricin. The murder did not, could not, silence the BBC World Service. My name is Seva Novgorodsev. Seva, Seva Novgorodsev, I joined the BBC World Service on the 1st of March 1977 and said my adieu to the corporation on 15th of September 2015. So it was 38 and a half, or well, thereabout, years. When you left the Soviet Union, what was it like? The system of control was extremely stifling. Привет, привет, всем привет. Сегодняшнюю программу «Великолепная десятка» мы начинаем с бодрых звуков. Конечно же, это молодежный вокально-инструментальный ансамбль «Душителей». What kind of music were you playing? So I was uh, basing my choice on either BBC charts, uh, singles, albums. So... It was a little, tiny little island of freedom. And then the letters started to arrive. Initially, via third countries, sent through with the foreign students as couriers. African students, we had some Albanians, some Syrians, some Yugoslavs, etc. And so these letters would reach me and generally, audience started to shape the program to instruct me which way I should be moving. And so the evolution took many years and resulted in what we got in the end. And Seva Novgorodsev was popular. The Russian service had 25 million listeners across the old Soviet Union. Yes, you heard that right, 25 million listeners. And they got some amazing guests. Yeah. Good evening. Good uh, evening. Can I call you just uh, simply Paul? Yeah, please. Okay. Привет, Russia. Paul McCartney on the BBC Russian service, taking questions from anyone, anywhere in the USSR in 1989. Okay, твой вопрос к Полу, Слава. Right, Paul, we have Vyacheslav from Oslava, from Minsk. Uh -huh. uh, we'd like to greet him. And uh, his question is, who's, uh, which musicians of the 50s has influenced you most? Okay, so Privyet Minsk. Um, okay, so the main people influenced me was Elvis Presley, Little Richard, and Buddy Holly. I think those were my three big influences. You know, I learned to sing a little bit like Elvis, and then some other times a little bit like Little Richard. And uh, we also love Buddy Holly. Those are my three big favorites, I think. Well, thank you. Yeah, okay, mate. All the best. Uh, 
I was doing the simultaneous translations for whatever um, Paul was saying for the Russians. Those listeners phoning from the Soviet Union was not easy. I know, but the technicians with the Bush House were extremely inventive and resourceful people, dedicated to their work like nowhere else I've seen. They spent two or three days preparing to eat technically. Hello, Ola. Hi, Olga. Well, the question is, you and uh, the rest of the Fab Four, you've never been to the Soviet Union. How did it come about that you wrote a song back in the USSR? Well, actually, there's a song by Chuck Berry, which was called Back in the USA. And he, he talks about, you know, how great it is in America, you know, a real American kind of song we're always talking about. So it's really a parody on that song. So I took American things like Beach Boys, because there's kind of all that, woo it's very Beach Boys. And I made a kind of American sounding song, but just changed the whole idea as if it's a, a Russian kind of going home, you know, and it's just to kind of show really how similar people are. After the Second World War, my parents would tell me, you know, we were together in the world, we were allies. So we always kind of looked upon them as friends, but obviously with, uh, you know, all the politics and stuff, there was this cutoff and we never really sort of talked to them and stuff. So to me, and I think a lot of people over here, when we see that the attitude from Russia is warming up and is opening up and uh, we're able to talk like this. There was so much optimism and hope in 1989. Three months after that interview, the Berlin Wall was breached and the Iron Curtain rusted through. By the end of 1991, there was no longer any USSR to be back in, but 15 separate countries, including Ukraine. BBC World Service for Africa. My name is Elizabeth Ohini. I'm Ghanaian. I'm speaking to you from Accra, Ghana. How long did I work for the BBC? I think I, it feels like I worked for the BBC forever, but indeed, between the years 1986 to 2000. It was a very welcoming place because the whole world was there. And the languages, that's what I liked about that place. And the canteen, <laughs> the canteen in Bush House was something else on any day. At whatever table you choose to sit at, you'll find something new, something interesting. The canteen in its heyday, when you had 40 odd language services, was, you know, the Tower of Babel. Almost all of us loved going down there because you met so many interesting people. I mean, you could always have a wonderful conversation in the canteen with someone. It broadened your outlook very much. You learned a lot from other people. I love that, you know, that I missed up to this day. Welcome to 1156. The name of the show is Network Africa. Okay, I was working with the African service. We had Hausa, we had Kiswahili, French, Somali, yeah, 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 yes, Somali service. Alkali, who are BBC, Latin, or Alkali, Senesan Moja, the Haga Gabon, yes, at the Hyo Tobanka. I'd say everybody was listening to us. It gave you an exaggerated sense of power and responsibility that is quite beyond imagination. During the Liberian War, and this is not just anecdotal, it is a fact. I saw it happen, going there to cover the war. And at 5 p.m. GMT, the war stopped. Everywhere stopped. They stopped to listen to Focus on Africa. The country came to a stop. The war itself stopped, and they listened. BBC World Service at 17.09 Greenwich Mean Time. This is Chris Pickerton with Focus on Africa. And when we finished, then they went back on to shooting each other or whatever. To focus about his guerrilla war against the MPLA. Libya continues to deport... News had to get on the air fast. In the soundproof studio, presenters sat at the microphone. But behind the glass, editors, producers and studio managers were frantic, putting the pieces together on a bank of whirring tape machines. For 50 years after the Second World War, 
all World Service programs were recorded on spools of magnetic tape, edited with a razor blade on a block and spliced with sticky tape. John Goda well remembers his days as a studio manager. I used to do focus on Africa sometimes. I focus on Africa. People used to come in and throw the tapes at you just as you needed them. They'd be reading the cue for the thing you needed to play out, and you'd hear them running down the corridor from the office where they'd been editing it, trying to shorten it, and they'd literally throw it at you. And they'd go, oh, it's tail out, they'd shout, which means they've not wound it back onto the spool for you to play from the beginning. So you're scrambling to rewind it and find the beginning of it. The presenter can see you through the glass, so you can hear them slowing down, gradually trying to say more words while and then that you turn around and look at them at which point they'd speed up and go and here's the latest from and then play and it's very hard to beat that feeling of being able to just get it right wouldn't miss it for the world i think doing that to a deadline is one of the most exciting things i've ever done i love it everybody knew the presenters i was in zimbabwe we were walking in the fields trying to get to some town and there was this young boy listening to the radio and he was resting under some trees and his cattle were scattered around. But then the boy heard Elizabeth's voice as she spoke to a colleague. And this little boy just jumped up from where he was lying and he said, you must be Elizabeth Ohini. And I'm thinking, you are from Focus, from Focus on Africa. I listen to you every day. <laughs> but that responsibility, you have that reach. People are listening to you all over the place. What do you do with that responsibility? What do you think radio sh can do and should be doing with that kind of reach? If you wanted to start a rebellion anywhere in Africa, all you needed at the time was a uh, a satellite phone and the phone number to focus on Africa because uh, half the people of the country didn't even know that they were being attacked until they'd heard it on focus and that should we broadcast those things when people call us telling us that we are doing this we have bombed this we have done that there was a lot of soul searching there were arguments forever and ever in the Focus on Africa office. There were such discussions throughout the World Service, where I worked for 20 years, first as a scriptwriter, ending as chief producer of features and arts. Do it for all of us. One Christmas I wrote and produced a satirical Bush House pantomime for broadcast. The absurd malice in Blunderland was about management consultants, Malice and Scrooge, trying to close the world service down. In order to save it, the audience was asked, in true Panto style, if they believed in the world service. The growing chorus of yeses heard in the program was echoed by listeners who wrote in afterwards. Yes. 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 And so many people who worked at Bush House thought their job worthwhile. Broadcasting as a public service for everybody, everywhere. My first job was listener's letters. I was receiving these uh, little blue aerogram from Afghanistan, piles of them, and my job was to identify which letter goes for which program. So I would come on Tuesdays and go through these letters. Najiba Kazre was born in Kabul and worked for the Pashto service. The listenership was huge back home. Nearly everyone in Afghanistan listened to the programs in Pashto and Dari. So this is 92. This is the peak of civil war in Afghanistan and all the Mujahideen groups are fighting with each other. My family was still alive. I didn't lose my family at that time. So it's a time that I'm really concerned. And every time there was a rocket attack, my first reaction was to check where the rocket has landed. Is it near our home or not? Those letters were our connections to the audience. They were uh, the hope of people. They would really decorate those letters, you know, that sending their love with it. I remember once we received a letter that was 10 meters long or something. The letters were amazing. Najiba began to write and present programs for children and young people. 
We had a science program. We had a fantastic drama that was broadcasted, uh, New Home, New Life, from uh, Peshawar. You know, in every way that we could help, we would help people. When the Taliban first came to power in Afghanistan in 1996, radio became vital for people cut off from all other communication, locked up at home. I mean, can you imagine people were not allowed to listen to music, um, cars were checked if you had a cassette and that would be broken in front of you. We had music programs and we had a show for women. To have a jukebox program where you have uh, songs and programs where you have uh, presenters, the fun, the chit-chat between them and the laughter, it was the sign of normality. I think this is what we were. We were the drop of normality that people were hanging to. Najiba Kazray's mother, sister and brother were murdered in Kabul. Undaunted, she continued her courageous journalism. She challenged the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, in 10 Downing Street, about the British government's long-term commitment to Afghanistan. She even went back to Afghanistan to question the Taliban, men who did not approve of women working at all. I think um, the nation was experiencing a very traumatized time, exactly as now, because unfortunately those people are desperately seeking help today. Over 90 years, the technology of broadcasting has transformed. Transmission and reception are not like 1932. The digital has superseded the analog as the microchip has replaced the transistor and the thermionic valve. People do still listen on shortwave, but millions are listening, watching, getting in touch whenever they want. The internet has altered everything and is still evolving. News gathering itself has changed, says John Goda. So people, what about now? What people use mobile now? phones. You've got your studio in your pocket. It's a revelation. It's not that long ago that I was lugging 10 or 15 flight cases of stuff with me, which is a nightmare. Now, I might have a rucksack with a few bits in it. What do you think, John Goda, of the BBC World Service? What do I think of the World Service? I think it is vital, absolutely vital. I can't imagine a world without it. It really matters still. Mattered then? matters now, possibly matters more now. And I'm really proud that my job has something to do with making sure that's still on the air and there are people still listening to it. Nine decades of reporting and journalism, the first drafts of history, of which we've only been able to share fragments and meet a few of the thousands of astonishing people who've worked for this service all across the world. So many people and so much change still to come. But at its heart, the World Service still has certain core commitments. Honesty, integrity, trying to get it right, going to the source, telling the truth. Elizabeth O'Haney, what does truth mean to you? Huh, true. What you saw with your eyes, what you heard with your ears, what you are able to testify to a hundred years later, and not just for the moment that you said it. For me, that would be the truth. And do you think the BBC and the BBC World Service's commitment to the truth is important? It had better be. It ought to be that out of all this cacophony of noises and stations, you should be sure that what you hear on the BBC, that's the truth. Otherwise, there's no point of the BBC continuing, really. That's all you are there for. That's all we've ever been there for. The rest is chaff. World Services 90 was presented by me, Nick Rankin. Sound recordings of Bush House were by Robin the Fog and HowlRound. The program was mixed by Tom Brignall. The producer was Monica Whitlock. And it was a whistledown production for BBC World Service. 
This is the BBC World Service. And on the inquiry this week... It's a country living through one of the worst economic crises of the last century. Right now, it has no president and only a caretaker government to turn things around. On the inquiry this week, we're asking, why is Lebanon falling apart? The inquiry at bbcworldservice.com slash inquiry. At bbcworldservice.com, the fifth floor. He was nicknamed Putin's chef for supplying food and drinks at official Kremlin events. But now he's better known as the head of the shadowy Russian mercenary group Wagner. So who is Yevgeny Prigozhin? Find out more on the fifth floor. This is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station.